bless you all this evening. Um, if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 5, 1 Peter chapter 1. As you know, last time I talked about the overwhelming reality of the love of God. This time I want to talk about the overwhelming reality of the promise of salvation. And so we want to be reminded of how God saved us, how God brought us into the family of God. So, and you'll see in this passage of how Peter brings that into life. But let's go ahead and read the, the reading of God's word. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens or exiles scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Capitonia, Asia, and Bethania, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Be, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This is the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, let this not be my words, but let this be your words. Lord, I pray that um, let me get behind the cross, Lord, because this isn't me. This isn't about my message, but it's your message that speaks through me. Father, I pray as I proclaim the word that it says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. So let this be your message, your gospel. That way you would get all the glory in the end. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. 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 So um, before we break down this passage, let's talk about the historical context of this passage. Because when we do, you guys will be amazed and utter shock of what was going on during this time. God used Peter to write this epistle back in 64 AD. This is when the Roman Empire was, went through a terrible fire. And during the time, Emperor Nero, who ruled 54, um, 54 to 68 AD, saw the fire cause not only devastation in the empire, but also in the city of Rome as a whole, which led to people to be homeless, some helpless, and even worse, some of the people of Rome died because of this fire. This caused complete bitterness in the people of Rome. So what did Emperor Nero do during this time? He told the people of the city that the Christians set the city on fire. This is why, through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, Peter writes this to his brothers and his sisters in Christ in the first part of verse 1 of our passage. To those who reside as aliens or exiles, Scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Capitonia, Asia, and Bethania. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, part A. In short, because of the terrible treatment the believers were getting from Rome, they scattered to find refuge. And even during this time, some believers were very discouraged of what was going on. Even in, the, even in this chapter in verse 6, is a very good, a dead giveaway to all this. Look at verse 6. And this you greatly, greatly rejoice, and even though for now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. In other words, um, during this time, they would be sent to the Roman Colosseum, and they would be fed by lions, um, lit on torches, uh, on, no, lit on um, a cross, like torches and all. They went through severe persecution, and it was a terrible situation. However, Peter does not let these believers uh, leave them in their discouragement, but instead to encouragement that lasts for all of eternity, which is why Peter talks about them being scattered. After he talks to them about being scattered, he then reminds them that they have been chosen, the last part of verse 1, and it's all because of Christ and through the work of salvation and the triune God, which you see continuing in verse 2 of our passage, notice. 
chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled by his, with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Now, just when you think it doesn't get any better than that, Peter then goes on to what seems like a whole hall of fame of the promises of God. But for time's sake, we will just talk about the promise of salvation because there's a promise of perseverance. And then um, there's the promise of uh, that because of these promises we have in the New Testament, they were looking for this in the Old Testament, but we have a better promise in Christ. We have a better promise in him. Yes. And it's through him that we are truly saved. And that's what we're going to get into tonight. But before I do, I first want to all say that, believer, you may not be in the Roman Empire being mis misly treated or terribly treated. But you probably went through a time of discouragement, like uh, like what what was uh, Bo and um, what, what's the daughter's name again? Eva. Like even Bo were going through. They went through a time of discouragement and going through spiritual warfare. Or the time that I was dealing with my neighbor accusing our family for stealing things. So we all go through something that we go through on a daily basis. But however, what I want to remind you tonight of what your salvation is from and where our encourage is from. So this promise of salvation also will remind us of how truly, how powerful God is. So let's get into it. The promise of salvation. So after Peter reminds the believers that they've been saved by the foreknowledge of God the Father and how they continually being made holy through the Holy Spirit, Peter then, by the empowering of the Holy Spirit, reminds of how God saved us. Just look at this amazing reality in the first part of verse 3 of our passage. Notice this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. Now, what does this mean? We always talk about this in the church of being born again. Some people say turning a new leaf or it's a New Year's resolution. But what does it really actually mean according to the Greek? Well, this word born again comes from the original Greek word anesteno. This word means to be born into a new life. In other words, in order to be truly saved, we must be born into a new life with Christ. Mm -hmm. This is only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Just listen to what Jesus says regarding this in John chapter 3, verse 3. I think Robert made mention of this earlier this morning. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God or know the things of the kingdom of God through the word of God. Then if you look at Titus chapter 3, and I know I'm, I'm jumping around, and I know somebody's going to say, you jump around the, the Bible a lot, Blake, but I'm that's just showing you, exactly, that's the point of preaching. I'm just showing you the biblical evidence of all this. So that's why. It repeats exactly what both Peter and the Lord Jesus Christ were talking about on the subject of being born again, or as theologians call it, the doctrine of regeneration. Listen to this in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 5. And if you're not there, just, just go ahead and listen or, or take notes. Um, so let's go ahead and listen to this. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. In short, we can't save ourselves to get into heaven. It is absolutely impossible. You can try to walk somebody across the street. You can try to give us give a lot to the church, but none of that will save you. Yet, we are not without hope. For look what it says in the rest of verse 3 of our passage. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So just because we can't be saved in our own strength doesn't mean we are hopeless. Yet hopeful because of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And even when Paul was dealing with the church in Corinth, 
Some of them was even denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're like, well, how can, he, how can there be resurrection? Because, you know, if you study the Sadducees, they denied it. They were like the, the, the liberal party of the, 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 the religious leaders. They were like, well, we don't really believe in resurrection because how could there be a resurrection? <laughs> but yet, just listen to how Paul responds to this problem in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 15 and 17. Listen to this. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise. If in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, you are still in your sins. In other words, if Jesus Christ didn't die for us, we would still be dead in our transgressions and sins. We would be like the skeleton that's in the grave. We would just be staggered like this and be like, oh, um, it's like, come on, choose the gift, choose the gift. And it's just like, the person's dead. It doesn't, it can't believe. So what I'm saying of all this is that the more we trust the lies of the world and the people and in some way try to conform to their ideas, we are putting our hope in dead things rather than the living God. Yeah. Yet, as Christians and the elect are chosen of Christ, we have what's called the hope of heaven. Amen. Now, what do I mean by the hope of heaven? What do I mean by that? Do we just go to heaven because we have this hope, because we have hope in we one day will have an Alexis, or one day we'll have some sort of car. Well, if you look at verse 4 of our passage, Peter writes this, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Listen to this illustration. Just like how the President of the United States reserves a spot for a VIP or a very important person in the White House. So, in the same way, God the Father reserves us a spot in heaven for us because of the death and resurrection of his only begotten Son. And it's not only because I'm saying this, but just listen to what our Lord Jesus Christ says about this awesome truth about heaven in John chapter 14, verses 2 to 3. Listen to this. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But that's not even, that's not even depicts even the most glorious picture of heaven. You're going to see this back in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. I know I'm getting very excited. I might, like, I might do jumping jacks for Jesus. But listen to this amazing description in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 to, th I mean, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, during the time of the, uh, of the uh, Syrian captivity. Listen to this beautiful picture. In the, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim, or angels, stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And, and, and one called out to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Heaven is not a boring promise where we're going to be some wimpy angel wearing some white dress of some sort and playing a harp all the day long. No, the promise of heaven is amazing. It's wonderful. It is awesome. It is undescribable. And matter of fact, those words that I just described, heaven is blasphemous compared to what awaits us. Oh, my friends, oh, church of God, I must tell you that you will go through trials and tribulations. Oh, yes, you will get into car accidents. Oh, my gosh. You will, the people just always they like say, oh, I promise you insurance, but then you have to pay back, and you're just like, oh, they promised me, though. But yet, 
in heaven. All the promises are fulfilled. We're going to be worshiping God forever and ever and ever. And behold his glory. Behold his light. Behold him. And you can still behold him even today, believer. What an amazing promise that is. Amen. But notice this. And this promise that is incredible is only possible because God is protecting our souls. All of this is because God is protecting us. Listen to what verse 5 of our passage says about this. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This faith that God produced in us will never die. It will never fade out. It will never be as like a candle staying inside of somebody's house and you go, nope. Even if you go, it's still, it will never fade out. I want you to listen to what Dr. John MacArthur has to say about this beautiful promise of faith, how it never dies out. Listen to these awesome and beautiful words. Listen to this about the eternal faith of God. The Christian response to God's election in the Spirit's conviction is faith. But even faith is empowered by God. Moreover, the Christian's continued faith in God is the evidence of God's keeping power. At the time of salvation, God energizes faith. I think that's why I do jumping jacks for Jesus. <laughs> and continues to preserve it. Saving faith is permanent. It never dies. Amen. In short, God's faith in us is eternal. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you can't kill it with a knife or a gun. You can't stop it with a big bulldozer. You cannot blow it up with a missile. Even in a nuclear warfare, you can't destroy it. God's salvation is forever and ever. Amen. For salvation belongs to the Lord. Psalm 3.8. So that's the end of my message. But however, I want to ask the question, what does this all have to do with Christmas? I believe this is that this is why Jesus came to be born of the virgin. Is that he he came to die, but he didn't stay dead. He also Amen. came to redeem. Amen. Amen. Amen.